I'm a native Rhode Islander. I grew up in North Kingstown, uh, and I'm really concerned about my state. I've been concerned about my home uh, for as long as I can remember, as, as all of us are aware of listening to the talk radio even this morning, newspaper, uh, our state's economy is in the tank. Uh, we're looking at a budget coming out next week with tax increases, even in this horrible economy. Uh, we're firing teachers in Providence. The city of Pawtucket has just borrowed, I think, $13 million to pay cash flow. Uh, so, you know, I've, we're here because we're concerned about the future that we're leaving our children. And that's really been, uh, it's about the children. And it's been where my life, my professional life, has been uh, since the early 90s. I started off in private child welfare in Chicago was working in an emergency shelter there in the inner city of Chicago. Uh, was running it um, at one point. After Chicago, I spent time in East Africa, uh, worked doing both education and uh, youth development in conjunction with the Ethiopian government. Uh, came back to Rhode Island about 2004 to lead an abstinence education program and a parental adolescent education program. You know, how, do, how, do, how do you be a parent? One of my favorite courses was uh, don't smash the iPod, <laughs> you know, because how do parents deal with all the media and all the influences on their kids? And it's just what our kids are up against these days is, is just tremendously difficult. I have three of my own. I have a 13-year-old daughter who thinks she's 21. Uh, I've got a 10-year-old son and an 8-year-old son. And, and the things that they have to face, you know, it's cliche, but they're things that we never had to face, I never had to face. And the pressures that that brings on parents has always been a crucial issue. For me. In 2008, I moved over to the National Organization for Marriage, again, because it's the question of what are we leaving our children. Uh, it's not so much the question of marriage, that is, that is the element, but marriage is the vehicle for the world that we leave our children. Marriage has always been about bringing the two genders together, male and female, to raise the next generation. And we're in a debate right now where the idea to redefine marriage uh, to any two people, or in the future, any group of people, eliminates that idea that marriage is about children and it's about the future. Um, you can go out to the grocery store today and you can buy seventh generation cleaning products, eco-friendly cleaning products, because we're worried about what we're leaving our children in seven generations. Um, and that comes from an Iroquois Indian saying that, uh, that said, they said they wouldn't take a tribal decision until they debated the effects out to the seventh generation, even if it means having the skin as, skin as thick as a bark of a pine tree. So in, the, in ecology, we've got this idea of saving our world, and what are we leaving our future generations? Well, in the marriage and family debate, that should be the same issue. What are we leaving our children? And today in Rhode Island, Governor Chafee, uh, Speaker Fox, and other supporters of homosexual marriage they want to leave our children a world in which it's perfectly normal to ask my daughter, uh, you know, do you think you're going to get married one day? Yeah, of course I think I'm going to get married. Well, do you think you'll marry a boy or a girl? That's, that's their norm for my daughter, and that's their norm for every child here in Rhode Island. That's unacceptable. That is absolutely unacceptable. And, um... um Quite, quite simply, you know, we look at this idea that marriage, the, the, the modern idea that marriage or any social institution can be whatever we want it to be, um, it, it is a fallacy that, that ignores historic, uh, biological, sociological truth uh, that we are, we are vested, we, we should be vested in our next generation and the generations to come. Um, and when we start to separate the idea that children deserve to know and be known by a mother and a father, uh, we, are, we are leaving them, at best, something less than ideal, and at worst, something quite damaging. And, and the sociological evidence for that over the last four decades, five decades now, is, is huge. The impact of fatherlessness in our inner cities um, our incarceration rates, the costs that our society incurs because of fatherlessness um, with, with young men, excuse me, the cost of fatherlessness on young women. We wonder why we have such high out of wedlock teen birth rates. It can be tied directly to, the, to fatherlessness and the breakdown of the family. Um, and so when we tell our children, ah, mothers and fathers don't matter, it could be any combination of two people, three people, one person, and they're all the same, 
that is simply untrue. There is something different about bringing a man and a woman together to raise the next generation. Um, it's different on, on, on any number of levels. Let's, let's take interracial marriage and, and the Loving versus Virginia case that everybody likes to go back to and yeah. say, look at, right there the Supreme Court declared that, that interracial marriage is unconstitutional. And you know what? Absolutely is unconstitutional. The idea of separating people based on their skin color is an anathema to us, and it should be absolutely wrong. It was not an issue of their gender. It was an issue of, wait a second, discrimination based on race is wrong in every place and time. Therefore, interracial marriage ought to be allowed. When you move over to this idea of same-sex marriage or homosexual marriage is the same as that, what you're trying to claim is that your sexual identity, your sexual orientation, is the same as your race or your gender. Uh, there is no scientific proof for that. Even the American Psychological Association, who is so sure that homosexual marriage is good, they in, in fact themselves have said there's no science to back homosexuality as natural. Okay? There's no, there is no definitive reason. Now, I'm not sitting here telling you that it's all a choice. I'm not sitting here telling you I understand why someone is gay or lesbian. But I'm telling you that it's not the same as race or gender. It's a confluence of issues. Choice has part of it, upbringing, environment, genetic indicators. However, to say it's the same as race um, is, is, is a fallacy. And to claim that people such as myself or the vast majority of Rhode Islanders who believe that marriage is, is one man and one woman, to claim that they're bigots and they're being discriminatory. I mean, I talked to you earlier. I mean, we get th threats here regularly because supposedly we're, we're hateful bigots. Um, no, this isn't about bigotry. This is about protecting marriage. I, there, pre I prefer homosexual marriage. I prefer calling it a sp spade a spade. Right. When you hear same gender marriage, same sex marriage, y you get the idea that, you know, any two people of the same gender could marry. You know, let's, you know, two friends. You know, the, we, I don't know. You may recall there was a Boston Legal episode. I loved that show when it was on, and and uh, uh, William Shatner's character, uh, Denny Crane, and, and David Spader. You know, they got married so he could, so Spader could take care of, of Denny Crane. It was no no romance, nothing. You know, but it was. You know, that's not what they're talking about here. We're not talking about two friends taking care of each other. This is a movement of the gay and lesbian population who want marriage and who want to redefine it. So let's, let's make sure that we make people understand that this is homosexual marriage. Mm -hmm. um, things like reciprocal benefits, which is a, is a legal framework that we're actually going to be debating here in Rhode Island next week uh, on March 10th. Um, you know, there are ways to take care of our friends, our you know, two spinster aunts, brother and brother who, who may be single you know, and need someone to take care of them or to, to, to convey rights and privileges to uh, outside of marriage. What the gay and lesbian population want is to redefine marriage. Or that be no, uh, it's not civil unions. It, it's a, it, it is a gender neutral um, legal arrangement. It's not a civil union, it's not a domestic partnership. Uh, it is simply a way of saying this person is my designee for all of these things um, in kind of a blanket way. Right now, the truth, the truth be known, every aspect that we talk about in what I like to call small r rights, uh, the hospital visitation, uh, funeral arrangements, uh, insurance and all of that can actually be taken care of piecemeal. The legal frameworks are there for me to designate anyone I want to be my beneficiary, to see me in the hospital, and they exist for gays and lesbians as well. Uh, uh, reciprocal beneficiary arrangements would be kind of a, a blanket one, so you don't have to create this document, this document, that document. Um, civil unions are a completely different thing. They, they, they they convey all of the rights of marriage without giving the term. There's several problems there. Uh, one is that 
the most basic is that civil unions have proven to be a legal or judicial stepping stone to marriage. California, Connecticut, New Jersey, each time that they've been put in place, gay and lesbian advocates have said, no, it's not good enough. Separate but equal doesn't work. We demand marriage. Um, the key case being Proposition 8 in California. In California, domestic partners that was a s similar to civil unions had just about all the same rights and privileges as heterosexual married couples. Prop 8 is all about the word marriage. Right. It has nothing to do with those small r rights. It's, no, we want marriage. And people need to understand that, that this debate well, it's framed as civil as civil rights. It's framed as privileges and responsibilities of taking care of my loved ones or whatever. Um, those are those are red herrings. Those are smoke screens. They, it simply needs to be stated that those things can be taken care of in a myriad of other ways. What this is about is one group of people who want to redefine the institution of marriage for all of Rhode Island and all of the country, but particularly here in Rhode Island. They want to impose that on all of our hours. So does the word marriage? I would say just about everything you could, yeah. you know, I, I, I'm not a legal scholar, so yeah, I, yeah. I say everything because there's something, you know, like marriage shows up throughout the entire code of law in yeah. so many places. But the things that you hear, you know, in Rhode Island, in uh, this is oh, this is 10, no, we're in 11. So yeah. 09, yeah. we had the, the, domestic partners funeral arrangement bill and you may recall that Mark Goldberg uh, a, a very fine young man um, uh, you know he his his homosexual partner died suddenly and they didn't they had a lot of arrangements they weren't married in, hadn't been married in Massachusetts but they did have a, a lot of that paperwork and 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 when Mr. Goldberg's partner died suddenly Mr. Goldberg couldn't get his body, his partner's body released to him. His partner had no family. It was a tragic situation, absolutely tragic and completely, completely ludicrous that Mr. Goldberg had to go through this. Because in fact, the law was on his side already. But because of this uproar, we went through the process of creating a whole new set of law, passing it, seeing it vetoed, seeing the veto overridden, when in fact, the law was on Mr. Goldberg's side all the time. Um, NAM, Rhode Island, the National Organization for Marriage, we don't oppose those type of things. We believe that at living in America, we all have equal rights, those small R's. We should have access to health care, access to our partners, access to our loved ones, and be able to name in our own independence who we want to care for us or receive benefits. But you can do that without redefining marriage. What about That, and that, that's the case in Rhode Island as it is. Uh, homosexual marriage, uh, excuse me, gay, gay adoption um, was approved over a decade ago in, here, here in Rhode Island. And it's problematic. I'll, I'll tell you honestly that I'm not entirely comfortable with it because I believe mothers and fathers are absolutely crucial. Okay? I, and I know uh, gay couples who have children, and I can look at them and I say, You're a good mother, and your partner's a good mother but your daughter doesn't have a good daddy, <laughs> okay? Sure. Let's, not, let's not pretend that two women together are the same as a man and a woman together. There is a difference between the genders. There is in t not just biological, psychological, genetically made up, we have different roles. And you can look at that throughout history. This is not propaganda, this is simple truth. Mm -hmm. um, and so while th the young girl may have two very loving mothers, she does not have a daddy. And we have proven the importance of fathers to our young women and our young girls um, and, and the impact of family fragmentation and of divorce and unwed childbearing is huge in our state. Um, just, you know, talking about that, uh, you know, when we, when we, when we, when we endorse same-sex adoption, which is legal, and I'm not proposing that we repeal that, not at all. But when we look at that, we have to realize that what we're doing is intentionally depriving a child of a mother and father. And those of us who believe that mothers and fathers are distinct and equally important to our children have to say that is not the ideal situation. Two mommies, two daddies, it's better than none, but it's not the same and it's not the ideal. Um, in Rhode Island, 
studies have conclusively shown that uh, using 2000, 2008 dollars, um, that in 2008, Rhode Island lost $209 million in one fiscal year as a result of divorce and unwed childbearing. Okay, children growing up in broken homes or it were to single moms cost the state $206 million. That year, our state deficit was $219 million. Okay, parenting and marriage is not just a cultural phenomenon. It is a huge sociological and economic issue for our kids um, and for the future of our kids. We're about to debate a budget which sees $290 million in, in shortfalls this year, and it escalates over the next few years. 66% of that can be tied to the breakdown of the family. And as we move forward with, with homosexual marriage, we are simply breaking it down further. We are loosening those bonds between children and their parents. I'm not saying we're loosening the bonds between two adults. That's not it. The issue is children, and what are we leaving our children? Arrangements? Absolutely, or absolutely not. Yeah. The, the idea of negating the institution of marriage based on the tiny exceptions mm -hmm. it is ludicrous. It, it's laughable. I, I, I won't laugh out loud okay, at okay. it, but the issue is it's ludicrous. It's, it's like saying somebody collects cars. Okay, Cars are meant to be driven. I drove to my office. My trunk was full of stuff. I knew I needed it in my office for this interview today. And so I put it, it was all in my truck, I drove my car to work, I parked it, I unloaded my car, and then I went over and parked it again. Cars are meant to be driven and used. However, I have an aunt who has an old Triumph TR3. It's on blocks, never drives it. Is it not a car? Because it's not doing what 99.9% .9 of other cars do? No. The argument is, again, go back to the word fallacy. Uh, marriage is designed to bring the genders together and in the ideal situation to bring the next generation. And that is how 97, 98, 99, I don't know what the exact number is, percent of children come into this world. And so to argue from, from an extreme to try to negate it, there's probably a technical, logical fallacy term for it. It's both. Okay. Uh, it is absolutely both. Uh, it, you know, it's Nam's statement of being is protecting marriage and the faith communities that sustain it. Okay, we're not naive. The, the faith communities have a vested interest in this, and they have a they have an argument for marriage, excuse me, based on their theology, based on their history, their tradition. However, that does not need to stand on its own. We have sociology, we have economics, we have biology, we have history that show us the importance in, in, in uniqueness and specialness of marriage. So it's, it's very clearly both. One can make the case for marriage without referring to any faith tenets whatsoever. Um, and if you, if you review probably 99.9% .9 of my tapes from being on the radio, I, I never bring the faith issue into it. We don't need to. That doesn't negate it. Okay, um, the the Judeo-Christian history and ethic um, that that teaches the importance of marriage and teaches the uniqueness of one man and one woman coming together to you know to use a term in Genesis to be fruitful and multiply to fill the earth and subdue it is simply a, a statement of the is of the very real truth we see in history and sociology and economics and biology. They work together. Um, for faith communities, though, this is a particularly important issue, not just because of their beliefs, but because of the potential impact on them in the future. So faith communi communities ha have their faith tenets, they, whether it be the Bible, the Koran, um, they, you know, for, for Jews, the Torah, uh, that, that teach them the importance and, and the truth of marriage. But they also have, a, they have an issue with redefining marriage because of the future implications. If marriage is redefined in Rhode Island or in the country, it becomes social policy. It becomes part of the social policy. Marriage goes throughout all of our social policies, our laws. It's there. If you redefine that word, it impacts all of that. And the state then has the duty to enforce that social policy. Okay? It has a duty to force, enforce that social policy. 
churches and other faith communities are then forced to look at this and say, am I going to teach truth over and against the stated social policy of the church? Am I going to act on, my, on our corporate beliefs? Or am I going to compromise them? Because the state then has the threat of its power in tax code, in hiring and firing issues, in non-discrimination law, to say, no, what you're doing is discriminating, and that's against the law, therefore you either comply or lose your license, lose your tax-exempt status, lose whatever it might be. Okay, And this is not far-flung. Which just this week, in the, in the, in the UK, in, in Great Britain, a Christian couple was denied adoption rights based on their faith. Okay? UK. Look at Sweden. Pastors there, after they approved same-sex marriage, pastors there were in fact arrested for teaching biblical truth about marriage. That marriage is one man and one woman. Okay? Canada. Similar issues. In Canada, it's hate speech. Hasn't gotten there in, in the United States as far as the church corporately, but it has gotten to people of faith individually. Um, a, a biblical, not excuse me, a marriage counselor in Georgia refused to provide counseling to a same sex male couple, marriage counseling. Their, this counselor's belief said, I don't believe you're married. I can't do it. But there's somebody else in my practice that will do it. Well, that counselor was sued for discrimination and lost. Uh, a, a, an artificial reproductive technology doctor in California, because of her faith, said, said to this lesbian couple that wanted to be artificially inseminated, I can't do this. I don't, I don't believe it to be right. But one of my other, other the doctors in this practice will do it for you. The couple was successfully artificially inseminated, had beautiful child, I think children actually, in the process of this, but the first doctor was sued and lost. Okay, her freedom of conscience, her freedom of religion was directly impinged. So while community, faith communities, churches and Christians or Jews or Muslims in general who, who believe marriage to be one man and one woman have their religious tenets, they also are concerned about the future. Is it going to be illegal for me to stand up if I'm a Christian and say, I believe marriage is one man and one woman? Is it going to be illegal if in the Catholic community, John Paul II, who wrote the Theology of the Body, subtitled it, and he created them male and female? Is that going to become hate speech? That is the direction that this could very real, very potentially could go because of what we see across the world and in, in cases here in the United States. Parents who want to, be, for their religious purposes, for religious reasons, want to opt their children out of being read books such as uh, The King and King, okay, in Massachusetts. A case, uh, the families Parker and Wor Wor Worthland, excuse me, uh, in Lexington, Massachusetts brought suit against the school committees there because their children were, were given books like this. Mr. Worthlin, was, his son, was actually forced to sit through a hearing of this book. Uh, Mr. Parker, his child, got a different book in kindergarten. First uh, kindergarten and second grade. Okay. The parents lost their suit all the way up to the First Circuit Court of Appeals. were told they could not opt their children out, even though it was based on their religious beliefs. The school had a duty to teach this stuff. And the, and the First Circuit Court, when talking about the Worthland case, in fact, acknowledged that this book is designed and was read intentionally to cause children to be more sympathetic to gay marriage. Okay? This book, to second graders, we won't, I won't read it. I had my daughter read it the other day. Um, you know... It's a prince and prince. It's a prince. All the princesses come. The prince rejects them all. He doesn't. He, you know. This looks like my eight-year-old. Eight Girls. Ugh. Sees the boy. He's happy. It was love at first sight. He felt a stir in his heart. It was love at first sight. And this is to second graders. It ends with them kissing.
a parent was told by the courts of this country that they had no right to opt their children out from sitting under this teaching. This has deep impacts for our religious liberties. So that's, that is why faith communities are involved in this. Not only their, their, tenant, their historic religious tenets, but what is the future that they're looking at for being able to teach their truth and, and for Christians or Jews or Muslims to stand individually on their religious liberties. We call into question the legitimacy of his claim to have a mandate to redefine marriage, right. not, not a mandate to rule, or, and we didn't call into question the legitimacy of his governorship, but we do question and, and absolutely deny his claim for a mandate to redefine marriage in Rhode Island. He was elected with 36% of the vote. Okay. He got fewer popular votes than Bob Healy, who ran under the Cool Moose Party for lieutenant governor. Let's understand that when, when Lincoln Chafee stood in his inauguration speech and said, my first two priorities are to repeal E-Verify and redefine marriage in Rhode Island, he was absolutely out to lunch with what Rhode Islanders want. And to claim that Rhode Islanders backed him on that was ludicrous, and so we reject his claim to have a mandate to redefine marriage in Rhode Island outright. In fact, the majority of Rhode Islanders believe marriage is one man and one woman and don't want to see redefined. And at the very least, they don't want th this governor and this assembly dealing with things like marriage, e-verified gambling, or legalizing pot when our economy is in the tank. There is no future upswing on the horizon We've just learned that as a state for the last 23 years, we have a history of underestimating our revenue. So we have no basis for claiming we know what our economic situation looks like in two years, never mind 10 years. And yet here's the assembly and this governor saying, number two priority, redefine marriage. Rhode Islanders don't want that. They want this governor and they want this assembly to deal with the problems of the state. Well, first and foremost, we've got two bills before the assembly that w would redefine marriage and ho legalize homosexual marriage in the state. Those bills need need to stop. Okay, first and foremost, those bills need to stop as, as they are, and we're fighting those very strongly, um, both in the House and in the Senate. We've got a hearing in the Senate coming up next week. However, if there is going to be any move to redefine marriage, it ought to be done by a vote of the people. We've voted on ports casinos, changing the name of the state, how much more important is marriage? How much more vital an institution is it to our societies and our communities than a container port at Quonset Point, or opening a casino in Lincoln, or dropping a historical anachronism out of the name of our state? Marriage, the institution that brings the next generation and the generation after that, we want our state to recover. We want to see responsible citizens staying here and growing the state. It's about the children. If we're going to mess with the institution that raises our children, it ought to be done by a vote of the people. In Rhode Island, legally, there there would be a couple of options, but let's be honest. Let's be, let's be forthright here. We live under a constitution. If the people vote and say, fine, redefine marriage, that's what we have to accept. Okay? Flat out, we don't believe that's what will happen. 31 out of 31 states, when, when they voted on the marriage issue, protected marriage between one man and one woman. Okay? The majority of Americans believe that, even in, excuse me, even in very liberal California and extremely liberal Maine, the people stood up and said, no, marriage is one man and one woman. Okay, we're not talking about rights, we're, not, we're talking about the word marriage. Don't redefine marriage. Don't mess with marriage. Um, we believe we'd see that in Rhode Island, um, and, and we're very confident of that. If it went the other way, we'd, we'd look at options. Do, you know, a, a vote of the people would be a constitutional amendment. So the only way to overturn that would be another constitutional amendment. Right? That's, a, you know, that's a long way down the road. So. Yeah. We're confident that, we, that, that the people of Rhode Island would defend marriage as one man and one woman. The opposite. There has never been a vote of the people that has approved homosexual marriage. In fact, 31 states have voted 31 times to 
protect marriage and define it constitutionally within their state as one man and one woman. Completely the opposite. Right. Now, <clears throat> in Massachusetts, you had the Goodrich decision that, that imposed same-sex marriage in, in Massachusetts. Then you had Vermont and New Hampshire that followed, um, and Connecticut, and then Maine. Maine overturned their legislative act with a vote of the people, a people's veto in 2009. So you're left with, with Maine, excuse me, with New Hampshire, Vermont, Massachusetts, and Connecticut, and New England having approved in same-sex marriage. Iowa uh, legalized homosexual marriage by a judicial decree. Okay, and then the, the District of Columbia did it through their city council. Okay, so you have five you have five states in the District of Columbia. So what's important to realize for Rhode Islanders is that we actually are not the lone holdout in New England. We stand with the vast majority of America. Okay, if this was the United States of New England, this might be a different debate. But the majority of, of Americans have spoken throughout the years, starting about 2004, and defended marriage. There are only five states in the District of Columbia that have approved this, yes. and the, Iowa did it by judicial decree. Massachusetts did it by judicial decree. Okay, Connecticut actually had some judicial activism involved there as well. Let's let's understand that the people of Rhode Island who believe marriage is between one man and one woman are not bigots. They're not hateful. They're not homophobic. They are Americans, and they believe marriage is the best institution to raise children in. Um, NAM as a movement is first and foremost a grassroots movement. Okay, we, are, we have a national organization that is tiny compared to the call across the country. Uh, in Rhode Island, having a chapter, National Organization for Marriage Rhode Island, is unique within the NAM structure. Normally what NAM does when a state is under attack, or state marriage is under attack in a state, is to work with the grassroots organizations that are already there. Uh, family policy councils, other pro-life, pro-family organizations to help them defend marriage on their own turf. Uh, in Rhode Island in 2008, when NAM looked at Rhode Island and looked at New England in general, um, because they said, wow, there isn't a grassroots organization here in Rhode Island to work through. We need to open an office. We need to get in on the ground. And so we opened our broom closet. <laughs> uh, and that's why we're here, but we are a grassroots organization. Uh, the, the fact of the matter is, what will change the hearts and minds of the people who work up on Smith Hill in the House of Representatives and the Senate of Rhode Island are hearing the voices of their constituents. NOM serves as a, as a means to educate, equip, and encourage grassroots Rhode Islanders to stand up for marriage, to say, you can do this. It's not inevitable that marriage gets redefined in Rhode Island. And it's, in fact, your job to call your representative. It's your job to call your senator. It's your job to come out to a hearing. It's your job to write letters to the editor and op-eds and to make it clear that Rhode Islanders do not want marriage redefined. NOM serves as a catalyst for that, as a, as a facilitator of that. I'm one person. I have often get questioned, are you going to testify tonight? And I look at people and say, I may, I may not. Because there are 200 people in this room. I'm one more voice. I may have a little more knowledge, a little more practice, but it's actually Mr. and Mrs. Smith from 125 Main Street that are the important people in this. And they are standing up here in Rhode Island as they have across the country to defend marriage. They're standing up even louder this year because we don't have a Governor Kachiri. We've got a Governor Chafee. They know that they no longer have the backstop of a gubernatorial veto. And so it is truly up to the people of Rhode Island to stand up, and they are doing that. Um, you know, the mail, I mean, right in front of you in, is a bag full of postcards, well over a thousand postcards that represent postcards that have been sent to representatives by, by Rhode Islanders. And that was not sent to all Rhode Islanders. It was sent to key districts. People are standing up to speak about marriage and say, don't mess with marriage. And if you are going to mess with it, let the people vote. So that's NOM's role, and that's how we'll continue to work. We work we're working in Maryland right now, um, in other states where, where the battle is hot. But right now, Rhode Island is the place. 
um, it was several years ago now, but gay and lesbian marriage advocates created what they called 6 by 12. They wanted all six New England states to legalize homosexual marriage by 2012. Okay? They've got four out of the six. They lost Maine, and the people of Maine are the ones who said no. The people of Rhode Island are the ones that will say no here, too. Uh, NAM National also works uh, on a national level. Uh, for instance, we have the Defense of Marriage Act that was uh, was declared unconstitutional by the Massachusetts Federal Court and then horribly defended by Obama's Department of Justice. Um, and now recently, the, the Obama told the Department of Justice, don't defend it, okay? We are directly involved in finding interveners to defend that law and to to move the appeal process forward. Um, and we're working with Congress, we're working with, excuse me, local leaders from the, from the cir First Circuit. Uh, this, is a, this is an issue that would impact Rhode Island directly because we sit under the First Circuit. Those, the decision is controlling for Rhode Island. So NAM is involved in things like that. Uh, we've been, we were intimately involved in California Prop 8. We continue to help raise funds for those types of things. Uh, and you know, should it come to, should it come down the pike that we need a federal marriage amendment, uh, the National Organization for Marriage will lead that charge with other pro-family, pro-marriage groups. Uh, FRC is one of them. Uh, Family Research Council you're referring to. Uh, the Alliance Defense Fund would be another national group that are, are involved in this. Uh, but there are there are a myriad of them. And so we would we would <clears throat> we would work with them. We do work with them on, on on any number of issues, but primarily we are a grassroots organization. Our funding is grassroots. As a C4, we can only accept individual contributions. We accept no cor corporate contributions or, or grants that type of thing. So all of our funding is individuals. Uh, and I'm very proud to say that that the three-year budget for NAM in Rhode Island that we've, we've spent, or expenditures, has been covered by donations Rhode Islanders have given to NAM. Rhode Island is defending marriage itself. So while you have a national organization, it is a grassroots Rhode Island organization that is here and doing the work. It is. And it's sometimes busier than others. Yeah. So it all washes out to about. Okay. You know. <laughs> why choose marriage? Um, you could flip that around and say, why choose poverty? Why choose the environment? People are moved by different things. And it doesn't make it wrong for them to be moved by different things. Um, should I be upset with my environmentalist friends because they're not involved in the marriage movement? You know, no. We are moved by different things that different things motivate us. Um, and so it doesn't make it wrong to defend marriage because there are other problems like poverty, environmental issues, economic issues. We have a tool to bring to the table to deal with a particular issue and particular problem. Marriage the redefinition of it and the breakdown of the family. So NOM is focused on that. And yes, I get tons of hate mail that says, why don't you deal with the economy? Why don't you deal with divorce? Why don't you deal with or orphans or whatever? Well, there are other people doing that. NOM is here and it's been called by the Washington Post the preeminent organization standing against the legalization of same-sex marriage. That is our calling. Right. And just because there are other problems in the world doesn't make our calling wrong. Uh, no, that wouldn't be me. There's a Chris Plant who is a conservative talk, host, talk uh, show host out of D.C. Uh, you were heading down the right track because I did get a call from Fox News that said, we have you as one of the leading conservatives in, in Rhode Island. And I'm like, yeah, all four of us? But, <laughs> <laughs> you know. But no, uh, all of my writing has been confined to the Providence Journal and uh, recently marriage and family and prior to that abstinence, sex education. Um, so I certainly do hold to fairly conservative politics. I believe in the importance of history and looking at it and learning from it. Um, the idea 
that in the 21st century we are wiser than the millennia of people that went before us that recognized and regulated marriage between a man and a woman um, because of the importance of children that we haven't evolved into something better and bigger that we can suddenly separate children from their parents and from mother and father I think, it, I think it's absolutely that is laughable that suddenly we're smarter than our forefathers um, and I think that's the key to conservatism in general. You, you, you cherish the past. Now, you're not stuck in the past, but you go, wait a second. We've, you know, homosexual marriage didn't exist prior to 2002 anywhere on this planet. Anywhere. Okay? It was even in civilizations throughout history that were very liberal with their sexual orientation thing, issues and, and, and embracing gay and lesbianism, such as ancient Rome and Greece, they never entertained the idea of two men getting married or two women getting married. This is not about gay, gays and lesbians. This is not about homosexuality. This is about marriage. This is about saying, wait a second, why is government concerned about marriage? Does government care about regulating the relationship between a two adults? No. The government doesn't regulate my friendships. It doesn't regulate my... my uh, e even if I was, you know, living with someone, it wouldn't regulate that. The government gets involved in regulating marriage because marriage is where children come from 99% of the time. And government has a vested interest in protecting children and providing them the best environment to grow up. That is the only reason government's involved in marriage. And throughout all of history, no matter where you look, what tribe, what society, what country, what governmental organization, they have regulated who you can and cannot marry. And so 2011 in Rhode Island, we're suddenly wiser smarter, better, you know, how's it go? Higher, faster, stronger? No. No. What homosexual marriage boils down to is an effort by two adults to have their relationship justified in the eyes of the, of the government and maybe children become an accessory. Maybe they become an accessory, but they are not the end. Whereas in marriage between a man and a woman, Children are the end. They are the intent of almost all marriages. And therefore, that's why the government's involved. You know, what homosexual marriage does, and this, this uh, you, you'll probably like this, and I'll, I'll, I'll stand on it. It turns children into little teacup dogs. It's an accessory to put in my purse. I'm two men. You know what? I think we want a child. Children are now accessories to fulfill the whims and desires of two adults. No way. Absolutely not. Children are far more important than that. They deserve to know and be known by a mother and father. And we ought to be doing everything in our power to protect that. And we should certainly be doing nothing to weaken that. You have to get control for that. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I, I like it. It's better than, you know, a string of pearls or something. But I, I, I do. I think that's it. Let's, let's talk about New Hampshire a bit because it's very important for Rhode Island. Okay. Um, yes, New Hampshire did in fact legislatively legalize homosexual marriage in 09, 2010, that legislative session prior to the election. Um, as a result of that, a couple things that are very important. Um, as a result of that, the, the New Hampshire legislature saw a huge turnover and, and many, many, many of the legislators who voted for same-sex marriage were in fact voted out and completely changed the dynamic of the legislature in New Hampshire. Uh, just for instance, they have something like 400 state representatives. I don't figure, it's New Hampshire, I don't know how they figure that out, but they've got 400 representatives. The national organization got involved in the political races in 119 districts and supported 119 different candidates at various levels and for and all 119 won. We got involved in 12 Senate district races. 
10 of those 12 won. The marriage issue in New Hampshire, after it was legalized, became a hot button for the election. Okay? People who say that voting for same-sex marriage as a legislator has no impact are wrong. The same thing happened in Maine, where a strong number, and I just received numbers yesterday, six out of ten who voted for same-sex marriage in the Senate were voted out, and hi even higher numbers in, in the House of Representatives, or whatever Maine calls their House of Representatives. So it does have an impact. So what we're seeing in New Hampshire now, legislatively, are two things. One is, there are enough votes, both in committee and on the floor of the House of Representatives in New Hampshire, to repeal the same-sex marriage law. The question is only one of political timing. Okay? There are enough votes to do it. Uh, because the electorate, the grassroots people, stood up and said, you don't deserve to stay here. You think marriage is worth, it, 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 marriage and children are simply trifles to be redefined, you're gone. We don't want you representing us. And so there, there is the votes, or there are the votes, to redefine marriage in New Hampshire. Political timing will show when that happens. There also have been other movements, as, as you referred to, this idea of privatizing marriage, of getting mar of, of redefining the, that word marriage completely, striking it from the laws altogether and replacing it with domestic unions. We will hear that same bill here in Rhode Island next Thursday. The idea that government shouldn't be involved in marriage um, is, is deeply disturbing because government does have a vested interest in marriage, as I've already said. Its vested interest is not the relationship between two adults, but the children that come from a man and a woman joining together and the future. So social policy is designed not to protect the present so much as it is to ensure a future. And when we get stuck in this idea that it's only the present, and it, at worst, homosexual marriage is all about what I want now, whereas marriage is about the future and the children that come. Marriage between a man and a woman is about the children and the future to come. And so government needs to stay involved. And the idea of taking it out, you know, let's just get government completely out of it, doesn't make any sense from a sociological, economic, legal perspective. Um, it's not the relationship between two adults that's the important thing, it's the children that come. Sky didn't fall. The sky didn't fall. Right. Absolutely. The sky didn't, Massachusetts didn't fall. To think that a social experiment like redefining marriage would show profound effects in six years, and that's all it's been in Massachusetts. It's crazy. I've got to get better adjectives for this, but that's all it is. This is something that's going to play out over generations. Now, this is a problem that, um, that Americans, and I think human beings in general, have. I like to listen to sports radio, and I hear it all the time. Those are the most points scored since 2003 in a basketball game. We've played basketball for 150 years. Who cares about this eight-year segment, you know? We've become so short-sighted, so myopic, that our sense of history is only between the year 2000 and 2011. This country has been around for 300, 400 years. Okay? The humankind has been around for millennia upon millennia upon millennia. And yet we base everything on a six-year cycle. If you tried to do that in statistics and sampling, you'd be laughed out of out of a statistics class. A six-year sample is nothing when you're talking about generations and the impact on the children. So, great, the sky didn't fall, Massachusetts didn't fall into the Atlantic Ocean, I agree. However, we've already begun to see the, out the, the outgrowth of this. Parents denied the right to opt their children out and to have control over their children's education. Okay, Big issue there. What will happen as we go further down the road? As children are further and further removed and the bond between children and their parents is further and further weakened. Uh, you know, I, I mentioned earlier that in Rhode Island the cost of family fragmentation and out of wedlock childbearing cost Rhode Island in 2008 $206 million. And that's lost tax revenue, TANF, uh, social systems, welfare, Medicaid, that type of stuff. 
Massachusetts lost nearly a billion. Okay? <laughs> um, we, we have no idea where this is going to go. And, and so let's, let's understand that what, what gay, mar gay marriage proponents are doing is they're proposing a radical social experiment. We've tried different social experiments. We've tried uh, no-fault divorce. 1969, then Governor Reagan in California signs into law no-fault divorce. He then later says that is his, his greatest political regret because his no-fault divorce spread across the country. The idea of marriage as a union, as until death do we part, just goes out the window and we become a, we move even further into a consumer society. What do I want now? I want a prettier, younger husband, a prettier, younger wife. I want somebody with more money, less money. And we lose any sense of stability in the marriage relationship. And we see the disaster that divorce is. You move further, uh, it's again, 60s, early 70s. Contraception and abortion and the idea of free love and free sex ain't no such thing. There are consequences. The explosion of sexually transmitted diseases throughout our society. One in four girls infected with a sexually transmitted disease in our country. Uh, you know, the social experiments that this country has tried, let's make no mistake about it, homosexual marriage and the idea of redefining marriage is nothing more than a social experiment that will have consequences over generations. Uh, and we, you know, it's false to think that we'll see them in one, two, six years like we had in Massachusetts. Uh, divorce, no fault divorce coming out of California in 69. And what we see now across this country in the impermanence of marriage and the idea that it's all about the adult and what the adult wants now. Someone younger, prettier, stronger, faster, richer, poorer, whatever they want. I'll just go change as a direct result of no-fault divorce. And then the breakup of the family and unwed childbearing, fatherlessness in our inner-city communities with, with incarceration rates three times the average. Um, uh, you know, again, unwed childbearing rates so high as a result of the breakup of the family and breakup of marriage. Uh, you also had about the same time contraception and abortion coming on the scene and the idea of free love and free sex. There ain't no such thing as free love or free sex. The consequences for our society and sexually transmitted diseases, one in four girls infected with a sexually transmitted disease, one in five Americans have a sexually transmitted disease right now, and that number is getting higher. That percentage is getting higher. It is a di direct result of this social experiment called free love given to us by contraception and abortion. There's no consequences, we tell our children. Wrong. There are consequences to the social policies we make, be it divorce, contraception, abortion. All of these things undermine our social fabric. And you know, we can't even be honest with ourselves. We want to believe there's no consequence. And now here we are talking about marriage, and we want to talk about, we, we want to delude ourselves into thinking, there won't be any consequences to this. Oh, and you know, we haven't seen any in six years in Massachusetts. Therefore, we must be right. We're not that wise. Human beings tend to be self-destructive. We have not done well in the last 50 years with our social, social policy, social experimentation. There's no reason to think that redefining marriage is going to do any better. I, actually, there is no country, no, no country, no state in the union now that does not have no-fault divorce. No-fault divorce basically says you can walk into the family court and say, Your Honor, we want a divorce, and we're not going to we're not going to blame anybody. It's the idea of irreconcilable differences. Okay. Don't ask us any questions. We just want to split up, and we're going to try to do it as amicably as possible. Now, there there still is fault divorce, where someone can come in and say he's he's abusive, she is uh, spending money, she's you've died, or he's this or whatever, and they point fingers. But every state, because New York just recently legalized no fault divorce has a clause that says, come into family court, don't point fingers, and there's a process to get you out of this. Easy. Uh, you know, if we actually had to work to get out of our marriages, if we had to sit there and look at each other, look square in the eye and say, you know what, these are the issues. Maybe we should work on them first. Maybe, we should, maybe I should give you a chance to work on your issues, rather than just bailing on you. 
uh, our, mar our divorce rates would be a lot lower. Now, let's understand something about divorce rates, because you hear, and you'll hear it from the same-sex marriage folks who will say, what harm can same-sex marriage do? Because heterosexual divorce rates are well over 50%. Well, in first marriages of, co of heterosexual couples that did not do things like cohabitate, did not engage in premarital sex, the divorce rate is minuscule. It's well less than 20%. The number escalates when, first of all, you have people who cohabitate or are involved in premarital sex, or when you begin to include uh, multiple divorces. Because once you divorce once, it becomes so much easier to do it again. So the reality is when marriage is done well, and okay, well can be defined in any number of ways, but fidelity, entering into it in a mature way, marriages last in this country. They do last. And, you know, one of the things you mentioned earlier, why is NOM, when you have all these other problems in the world, fighting gay marriage, why aren't you fighting the divorce rate? Well, in fact, the National Organization for Marriage is fighting the divorce rate. What you're talking to me about is NOM Rhode Island, a C4 designed specifically to deal with the legislative process of the legalization or the, or the non-legalization of homosexual marriage. NOM has an entire other educational arm called the Ruth Institute. They are a C3 organization. Their whole job is to make marriage cool and to teach college kids how to do lifelong married love. We understand the importance of that. We're not just this big ogre saying, no, 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 no. No. Homosexual marriage will have grave consequences for our children. But on the other end of the spectrum, we are working diligently to get the message to our college campuses, to our young people who have not had the privilege of millennia of stability, who in fact are growing up in a society, a, a consumer society, of, you know, using things like a tissue, I'm done with this relationship, let's move on, helping them understand how to do lifelong married love. And that marriage, marriage between a man and woman is really, really cool. Uh, so we are doing both things. Let's see, we've touched on, we touched briefly on the whole civil rights thing, the analogy to race, grassroots organization, marriage is cool, and even NOM Rhode Island is actually, I shouldn't say, it's just our C3 organization, NOM Rhode Island is involved in, in trying to promote marriage and, and, and encourage it. We have for the last two years we've had this celebrate marriage and family day at the war at, in Warwick at the Aldridge Mansion. About a thousand people came out. Uh, the first year we did a, a renewal of vows. We had about 250, maybe 300 couples renew their vows. So this this picture of Chris Pyatt, the big ogre, going, no, you can't have marriage. Well, that's true. Marriage is between one man and one woman, and it's there to designed to bring the genders together to raise the next generation. But we do work on the other end of the continuum, saying marriage is cool. And, yeah, divorce is a tragedy that needs to be stopped. Other groups work on it closer, faith communities, whatnot, but we are involved in that. We would love to see the no-fault divorce clause in Rhode Island get tweaked somehow. I mean, make it. let's talk about making it a little harder to get divorced. Um, because marriage is too important just to walk away from. You think about no-fault divorce, it has gone and separate, it, it has taken away the until death do we part, do us part idea. Uh, contraception and abortion has taken away the idea that children are integral to marriage. They become an option. Let's, well, I'll go on the pill or oh, I'll have an abortion because I don't want this child now. So we've taken children out of the equation. Now we're looking at homosexual marriage are we going to take out male-female from the equation? What's left? Right now, it's only two people. And how long does that stand? If we can redefine marriage for two same-sex, two people of the same sex, what legal, philosophical, or logical stop says you can't do it for three people or six people? There isn't one. The only thing that stops people from saying, if, I, if we redefine marriage, somewhere down the road we'll, we'll legalize polygamy, is the ick factor. 
We would never do that. 1996 in Rhode Island. The homosexual, the homosexual agenda really came onto the scene in Rhode Island. And a lot of our non-discrimination, accommodation, um, we're talk, uh, homosexual adoption laws came on the books in the mid to late 90s. Advocates at that point said, we'll never ask for marriage. And I, ha I have people in my circles who remember them saying that. They're asking for marriage. And, but they're saying now, we'd never ask for polygamy or polyamory, multiple couples. Why not? There's no legal, logical, or philosophical stop. So we've taken out, until death do you part, part, we've taken out children through contraception and abortion. We're arguing about whether we're going to take out male and female, leaving us marriage is only two people. Marriage has never been about just two people. It's not about the relationship. It's about the social impact of two people, male and female, coming together to raise the next generation. When I've talked to teenagers, we remind them that marriage is not just how you feel. It's, yes, you feel, you have some relationship. There's a societal element. Society recognizes it. We know what this ring means. There's a legal element. There are rights, responsibilities, and privileges. There's a familial element, both your nuclear family and the children that you bring in. And so to say marriage is only about love, and which is what homosexual marriage wants to claim, is wrong. That that's a that's a debate for a completely different organization. <laughs> that's fine. Um, you know, it, obviously, faith communities have a very different have, have different stands on that. Okay, you, if you get to talk to the Catholic Church, they're obviously going to give you their stance. Evangelical churches have different perspectives of it. We need to understand the impact. This isn't a question of whether it should be legal, readily available, whatever. At the very least, we need to understand the impact that contraception has had on our society and on the idea of children and on marriage. That when we say children become an option. You know, I tell high school students, you guys, uh, you guys like cars, I was talking to high school boys. Okay, my talk to you today is about cars and sex. Got their attention? They're like, this is cool! This, kid, this guy's going to talk about cars and sex! This is great! Okay? Cars. I have a Honda Accord. A really small Honda Accord. I'm not a really big guy, but my head does touch the roof occasionally. I want a sunroof in my car. Next car, the option is a sunroof. Homosexual marriage tells me that I'm an option for my daughter. No different than a sunroof. Homosexual marriage says, a woman married to my wife could raise my daughter as well as I could. Wrong. I am not an option. Fathers are absolutely crucial to the upbringing of their children, okay? And it is about sex, okay? Because marriage and sex together bring the next generation, and therefore the government's involved. So, cars and sex, you know, children become an option, fathers become an option, mothers become an option. There is no historical precedent for that. No sociological, biological precedent for that. It, uh, we, we do have ex these examples of people who, whose sexual orientation has changed. Uh, Meredith Baxter Burney comes out of being married, having children. She was in fact asked, well, you know, is this new? Were you always in denial? And she said, no, it's new. Something changed. Because she herself admitted it. I have an email this morning from a young man, a father now, married to a woman, who came the other way, came out of homosexuality, and now was living a very fulfilled heterosexual life. So what does this tell me? It tells me a couple things. First of all, sexual orientation is, in fact, malleable. It does change which goes direct, it can change. It doesn't always change, but it can change. It goes directly against the civil rights argument. It's not skin color. It's not gender. I can't change my gender without the use of a scalpel. I can't change my skin color without the use of bleach and whatever Michael Jackson used. Okay? It, those things are inbred genetic. 
Sexual orientation is far more complex, and we do hear stories of husbands and wives having been married, raised children, suddenly saying, wow, something's changed, I need a divorce, and they go off into a same-sex relationship. That does not negate their ability to be a parent. The, the little girl who has two mommies, those two mommies are not bad mommies. They're just lacking a good daddy. Okay? So this isn't a judgment on what that father may or may have done before he came, before he realized his sexual orientation had changed. Um, it's, not an, it's not an indictment of Meredith Baxter Burney for how she raised her children. Okay? Understand that there's something very complex going on here. But they were parents. And children need a mother and father. And that is the ideal. Doesn't go back. It doesn't. You know, we try to we try to rule the, our days from exceptions, and that doesn't work that way. No, it, it is and it isn't. It, it's it, it's related because the the bullying legislation and the bullying curriculums that you see spreading across this country and here, particularly in Rhode Island, is put out by the by the Human Rights Campaign, which is specifically designed to promote gay and lesbian uh, issues and particularly marriage. Okay, And the idea of focusing all of our bullying legislation and policies on one group of kids, gay, lesbians, queer, questioning, transgender, completely ignores the fact that no child should be bullied. Why are we picking on one group and giving them special treatment? Why is it that we're requiring our teachers and administrators to sit through all of this anti-bullying uh, education that is specifically and explicitly talking about sexual orientation, homosexual, gay, lesbian, transgender, queer and questioning children? They are children, and they, do, they should not be bullied. No child should be bullied. I have an eight-year-old son that is the size of a five-year-old. He is bullied for his size. He's picked up like a doll. He's dragged around. Okay? Why shouldn't my child have the same protection? So bullying legislation needs to be even-handed. And the idea that the gay and lesbian population is trying to hijack, and that is what they are doing, this bullying issue, as a way of promoting homosexual marriage, it is, we need a better adjective, is, is simply wrong. And I mean, I saw it, and we had the House hearings in early February. For approximately the last hour, it was about bullying. It was teachers saying, oh, these poor kids, wouldn't it be great if, they, if we recognized that their, their two dads were legitimate and they wouldn't be bullied? I don't know that, that that would change anything for those two kids. But why do we need to pick on them specifically? Why isn't every administrator, every teacher, every parent-child aide in the schools protecting every child. The bullying thing is a red herring. I really spend very little time here, maybe two or three hours a day, first of all, because it's so darn hard to park. There yeah, are yeah, the two corners where you get no meters and you can get two hours parking. So if I get up here at seven, I get three hours parking. Okay. Okay. And, but yeah, I get claustrophobic. and <laughs> I it's, a little, it's, it's depressing in here sometimes. TV. I need TV. <laughs> big flat screen right there. Yeah, really perfect. Perfect. Game you know, system to be all set. And let me tell you, uh, Starbucks can keep me caffeinated. And there's a certain part of me that enjoys doing conservative politics in a Starbucks because they tend to be so progressive, liberal in their politics. Right. What goes on in Starbucks? So I feel like a, I guess so. I feel like a rebel there. I, I, I've 